save on Tonys and Oscars and Emmys and Grammys. There's no red carpet because they're home in their jammies. From Melrose Place to Broadway to Janeway and her crew. Let Seth and James bring all the stars to you. Anywho. They're entertaining everyone. So who's going to grouse? Just sit right back and you'll hear some tales on Star. Hey everyone, James and Seth, it's just me. Um, it looks like I'm in an undisclosed location. And last night, Louis Black said it looked like we were in an assisted living facility. <laughs> we're actually in a hotel, we're in Provincetown. My Wi-Fi I was kind of just crazy in the opening. I'm gonna assume that it's better now. Jose, do I sound okay? I can sort of see you nod. Am I okay, Jose? Okay, he's nodding, but it's passive aggressive nod. Anywho, all right, so I was in the house. Um, Good morning, Philippines. Wait, someone is there? You're in the Philippines? Go to sleep. It's like, or oh, it's 8 a.m. Oh, good morning. Hey. Um, hi, everybody. So this is Stars in the House. Stars in the House began in March when everything shut down because James and I realized we had to raise money for um the actors fund because you knew nobody was going to be working. Now, the actors fund is a terribly named organization because it's literally like for actors only. And yet it's not. It's for everybody. So it should not be called the actors fund. It should be called the everyone's fund. It's for anybody in the entertainment field that needs help. So, yeah, you could be an actor or a singer or a dancer or an opera teacher, you know, anything in the actual performing part. But you could also be in the backstage part. You could be a stage manager in ASM. A dance captain, as Bayark would know very well, a um, box office person, an usher. You can also be anything in film and television. So you could be an actor in front of the camera, but you could be behind the camera, a gaffer, a best boy. And the point is, if you do any of those jobs in the entertainment field, and not just in New York and California, literally all over the country, you can go to the Actors Fund and say, can't pay my rent, can't pay my health insurance, I need groceries, whatever you need. And the Actors Fund will say, how much do you need? And then they'll give it to you. So right now, I mean, as soon as everything shut down, James and I are like, oh my God, everyone, no one's going to have any money. So we knew we had to start doing this. We started doing it in March. At this point, we've raised, I'm always off with numbers. I know we've raised over $450,000. Like we're like 457 right now or something. But the point is we raised over 450000 We don't have any corporate sponsors. It's just from people like you who watch the show and enjoy it. And then they send in money. $5 is the minimum and the maximum is whatever you want. You go to starsinthehouse.com to donate. It goes right to, now, by the way, if you need help, you go to actorsfund.org. And I know a lot of people are struggling. So if you're struggling, totally get it. If you can give some money, go to starsinthehouse.com. You're going to get a receipt. Oh, or by the way, you can also text it. And I always get it wrong. Hold on. You can text it at, hold on. It's slowly. You can text fund 2022 56512. It's streaming there. Fund 2020 56512. As soon as you do that, you're going to get a, a um, receipt. Forward that receipt to donations at starsinthehouse.com. I'm going to get a little list, and I'm going to forward it to one of our stars, and they will read your name on the air, just like the Jerry Lewis telethon for those of us over 40 years old who remember that. So um, donate at starsinthehouse.com, and then forward the donations. Um, anything else I have to say? What is today? Friday? What's the, I can't even keep track of what shows are coming up. Anyway, there's a lot of stuff coming up. Our 200th anniversary is coming up. So we're going to have these big reunions. Just stay tuned. If I subscribe, if you could subscribe to our channel right now, it really helps. It helps us just get bigger stars. You know, anytime we want to like pitch stars in the house, like how many subscribers do you have? So if you could subscribe right now, it totally helps us. And I'll also follow us on all the social media. You see a lot of photos. You'll see me like I airbrush everything. It's like I look amazing. So follow us on Twitter and whatnot. Um, we're also trying to do some nonpartisan helping of the democratic process. So I don't know if you remember, but Black Theater United was here for us every day in July telling everybody they have to get the to the census. You have to fill out the census. Um, it is the easiest thing to do. You go to 2020census.gov. You're running out of time. And what you fill out will help the next 10 years. So whatever you're doing right now will help get funding for your local hospital, for your schools, whatever. But you have to fill it out. 2020census.gov. Right now, what we're doing is we're trying to get people to the polls. And we have Poll Hero Project to come help. Here's one of our spokespeople. Her name is Lilia Scudamore. Hi, Lilia. Hi. Do you pronounce it Scudamore or Scudamore? Just Scudamore. So American. It's all good. <laughs> Um, okay, so tell everybody what Poll Hero is. Yeah, so Poll Hero is an organization trying to get young people to volunteer at the polls. Most people who work at the polls are 61 and over, over 50% are, 
<laughs> not, not that old. Like, I was about to go like, just like me. I'm not that old. But the point <laughs> is, the older you are, the more susceptible you are to COVID-19. So young people are not as susceptible and they also need money. So you guys are trying to get young people there, right? Yes, exactly. And you can make money from it. And it's a really great way to get involved in democracy really young. Um, for most states, you only have to be 16 to volunteer at the polls. So it's great even if you can't vote to have a sway in this election and help make sure people have the ability to vote. Yeah, that's the thing. You get paid. You don't even have to be 18 in most places. And right now, I don't know if you know, but the last election that just happened recently, there weren't enough poll workers. So the lines were crazy. All these places were actually closed. So you're trying to keep open all the polling places in America and you're trying to cut down the lines. You're basically just giving jobs to people. So if you're young or if you know somebody young, they go to pollhero.org, right? And how, like once they go there, like how do they get help? What does it do when they go to pollhero.org? Yeah. For sure. So if you go to pollhero.org, at the bottom, you'll see a big red button that says sign up to be a poll hero. And you'll click that and you'll enter some information about where you're located and your age. And then we'll just walk you through the process of signing up to be a poll worker in your state, because sometimes it can be somewhat confusing. And then just make sure you're engaged up until the election and following through on making sure you're helping others. It's so easy. And it's just a great way to, I mean, no one's making money. It's a great way to make money. So if you're not a thousand years old, get the to pollhero.org and tell everybody young that, you know, just post this and say, there's a job coming up, pollhero.org. All right. So Lilia, from now on, we're going to pronounce it scudamore. Am I correct? Yes. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> That's progressive. All right. Bye. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Pollhero.org. And just on a side note, as someone else just wrote, if there are any Asian Americans reading this, please make sure you were counted in this year's census. So it's such an easy thing to do. Like we just said, go to 2020census.gov. That is true. Okay, we have people watching from, from all over the world, from elaborate places, like I just said, um, from the Philippines, as well as, wait, I was trying to do a big reveal, New York City. The point is people are everywhere. And we are here to celebrate Flower Drum Song. And I never know if it's, Flower drum song or flower drum song? It drives me crazy. Flower drum song or fl oh wait, my light just fell. Wow, my Julie, my kid set up my lighting. You, know I, you stink. I pay you next time. Pay you? I literally bought you a massage today. Thank oh, you. Right. We're in Provincetown. Um, all right, so we are going to bring on some of the cast members from Flower Drum Song or Flower Drum Song, as well as the rewriter himself, famous Broadway playwright David. So please welcome first from the revival cast. How is it, Lana? Hello. Jose, in this time of no haircuts, why do I look like uh, Mrs. Lovett and Sweeney Todd and your hair looks amazing? <laughs> well, it's because my husband, Eric, and I have learned to use a clipper. So uh, he doesn't said. enjoy it at all. So, But I make him at least attempt to, to just do the side. You don't want to look at the back. The back looks pretty messed up. So we're just, we're just okay. gonna keep it. It looks going. amazing. Okay, so that's, that's Jose Lana, or should I say Jose Liana, as they yeah. called you in your Philippine tour. I remember back in those days. And then exactly. from the original cast of Flower Drum Song, she still looks 10 years old, the amazing Bayork Lee. <clears throat> hi, Bayork. Hi. So cute. And from, hi, lady. Byrock, by the way, Byrock signature Wi-Fi problems. No matter what, there's always a crazy delay. When we did a chorus line, it was like she would be smiling. You'd hear a full monologue happen, and then her mouth would start moving. So it's all good, but it's all good. So revival, original cast. And then from the rewrite of Flower Drum Song, please welcome David Henry. I'm pronouncing there's no Henry. Suddenly, now it's just David Huang. What happened to the Henry? No, I just didn't put it on my, um, you know, little... Uh, Zoom thing because it'd be really long. Then it's, like, it's like Sarah Parker. She's Sarah Jessica Parker. Get it together. You're David Henry Huang. Okay, all right, I'm gonna it's try all to, I'm gonna try, try and to revise from, it so during this call. I'm gonna try to revise it during this. Call. Excellent. You are a writer. Namaste. Okay, so then so we have Jose from the revival, Byrick from the original, David from the rewrite, and then from 45 different productions per year. We have Alvin. He has literally done Flower Drum Song since the beginning of time, and he's basically still doing it. He's doing it right now, I think. Please welcome Alvin Ng. Hi, Alvin. Hi, oh, Harry. blank screen. Hi. Hi. How's Hi, it? everybody. Hi, Alvin. Hi. We have one more person, by the way. You know, I was saying people are watching from all over the world. Well, people are watching in Manila, 
but it's 12 hours later, no, 12 hours earlier in Manila or later. So it's 8 a.m. in the morning. So that's a normal time if you have like a nine to five job, but most of us theater folk wake up at noon. So Leah Salonga was like, peace out. I'm not doing it because she's in Manila. However, Leah Salonga very kindly did send some stuff. So here she is saying hello. Hi, Leah. Hi, everybody. It's Leah Salonga coming to you from Manila. I'm very sorry that I can't join you all live, uh, but I send all my love to my Flower Drum Song family. I hope that all of you are staying safe and healthy and connected. And I really look forward to the day that we can all reunite somewhere very, very soon under the same roof. Fingers crossed it'll be sooner rather than later. Love you guys. Uh, we love our Leia. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. So by Arkley, I'm praying your Wi-Fi is gonna keep up. You were in the original production of Flower Drum Song. Well, first of all, for people that don't know, you were in the original King and I back in the 50s when you were a little, little, little girl. Please tell everybody your prediction when you were, you were kicked out of King and I because you got too tall, right? You were like four foot seven. You got kicked the hell out. Am I right? <laughs> I uh, outgrew my costume um, at eight years old. So I was collecting unemployment and uh, <laughs> at eight. And... Um, and so um, I just knew that uh, I'd be back again. That was my thing. I'm, I'll be back. And she uh, literally said it. <laughs> Tell everybody how you said it. I'm coming back. <laughs> she went to the subway. She turned back around. She raised her eight-year-old fist and she said, "I'll be back." That's what I'm obsessed with. Okay, so how many years later did you come back in Flower Drum Song? How old were you when you finally came back? I came back when I was twelve. <laughs> so many gigs incredible yes. so were you there from the were you there at the first day of rehearsal like the original cast yes yes wow. first day of rehearsal um but my story is that i was i started in the show i was still uh in um elementary school and i was going to high school and so um huh? i got into performing arts high school which is the laguardia and I had to tell the management that um, on matinee days, I could not uh, be there, you know, to sign in. And so Teddy Hammerstein and I, we agreed because uh, the school was on 46th Street and the theater was on 44th, that I could come in at three o'clock. As soon as the bell rang, I, on matinee days, I would run down. Yeah, so at lunch, I would put on my makeup. All my girlfriends would ha hold everybody back while I put my makeup on. And I would run down, um, you know, from 6th Avenue to 8th. And my dresser, Ray Warner, would have the costume out. She'd take my books. I'd jump in the costume. And I would just run on the stage. <laughs> But, That's everybody's dream. I know, but it didn't last that long because one day I was very flamboyant and I walked out of the theater with makeup on and my ballet teacher was walking down the street and she turned to me and she said, oh, you're still in the show. I thought you left to, to be at school. And so the next day I was called up with my mother and they said, you have to make a choice. You leave the show or you leave the school. And so my mother made the choice for me. I left the show. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, that's How a long How long into the run were you in the show? How long what? How long into the run before you left? Oh, I, I think a, a year, a year and a half or something wow. like that. Yeah. No, so you had a long run, please. <laughs> Moving on. Okay, I'm going to show a little clip. This is, um, I love, by the way, the reason I love Flower Drum Song, and I've been telling this to parents, is like I grew up near New York City, so I did get to see Broadway shows when I was a kid in the 70s. But seeing local shows meant more to me in a sense because it was people like me and the local junior high school was doing Flower Drum Song. A lot of Jewish kids as Asian. We'll talk about that later. But the point is, it was still so cool just to see people like me doing a musical. And I became obsessed with Flower Drum Song because I started my junior high school. This is um, the Ed Sullivan Show. I love this. It's such a beautiful melody. Here, let's watch a little clip. So beautiful. A hundred media miracles. A hundred 
So it's just beautiful, so simple, so much simplicity to it. So Alvin, how did you get involved and stay involved? Well, I didn't get into the Broadway show. I joined the first national company and uh, I became the understudy to Wang Ta. And do you know that I never went on? <laughs> it, it was a year and I don't know how many months I never went on. Oh my God. I was so upset. <laughs> but then later on, of course, I did summer stock everywhere and I and then <clears throat> I made up for it. And then I got into the, the revival, of course. And so and then I was in Vegas uh, twice. So you know, I did it everywhere. I did it everywhere. So <laughs> never went on in my day. Understudies were always going on because we were late. We were lazy. Once the nineties oh, happened, we all got lazy. No, but times have changed. In my day, no one would want to give up their role. No one. Yeah. Now yeah. I hear that people just. I mean, understudies are on all the time. So yeah. times have changed. They really have. We have we have matinees. Don't get me started. Jose Lana, you made your first splash in The King and I. Which is amazing, but also means, girl, you can't, you can never do the chorus because you began as a lead. So there's a lot of pressure, especially being, especially being Asian American. It's like you're so yeah. young and you can only play leads. How many damn leads are they going to be? So, how thankful were you when Flowerdom Song came along, and how panicked were you? You weren't going to get cast, <laughs> right? No, I mean when 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 the when the show came around uh, first, they did workshops, which I were I was not a part of. Um, I think I would that was the, that was Paolo and 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 Jen Paz. And like I heard, I heard it was happening, but I was doing another show. And um, no, I mean, I think I, I what I love about Flower Drum Song, even compared to King and I, is that um, Flower Drum Song was the first time someone wrote about the Asian American, specifically the Asian American experience. Like that, it wasn't an Asian story set in some far off place. And the 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 fact that it was about an Asian American experience, and that there were people, that the relationships and the, and the tension in the story was about the young and the, the young and the old, you know, and and the, the old and the new. And so. Um, it was just really exciting, and and with David uh, coming in and 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 taking hold of the new story, it, it was it was just an honor to be a part of it. It was, and also to work with my childhood idol Leia was just it, I was beside myself. So yeah. Okay, two things. I want to talk to David in a second. I forgot to mention two things. First of all, that beautiful song you just heard, you're gonna hear a lot of it because the albums are out. There's I know the original cast recording is now a two LP vinyl vinyl set from Barnes and Noble, which is amazing. Um, it's such beautiful, beautiful music. And also, of course, the revival is also out. And the second thing, second thing I want to say is that there's a birthday happening tonight, one of our viewers, and instead of birthday presents, she's telling her friends to donate to Stars in the House. So I want to say happy birthday to Jenny Weaver Barbieri and all of her friends. Thank you for donating. StarsInTheHouse.com, forward those receipts. Believe The Actors Fund, man, health insurance is getting really hard now. People cool. are losing it, and people really need money. Um, so David... The original story was basically written by a lot of white people at, about the Asian American experience. Did you come in and just rip that script the hell up, or did you what What did you leave besides the title "Flower Dump Song"? How did what How did you fix it? Uh, so I think it's worth noting first of all that the uh, that the original book was based on a novel by a Chinese American author C. Y. Lee, mm -hmm. um, who. Uh, was certainly around during our revival. I have to assume he was around during the original too. Um, and still really sprightly uh, at 90 whatever when we were doing when we were doing our version. Um, so you know, as Jose says, it was the, it's really the only Broadway show that I've ever been able to find, play or musical, prior to 2015 that deals with an Asian American story. So any sort of theater geeks who are on this um, web, you know, who are listening in, watching, if you happen to know of anything else that contradicts this, I would be curious. Because anyway, 
certainly in terms of big Broadway musicals, um, Flower Drum Song was it. And so the fact that it had kind of fallen off the face of the earth by the late 90s, it just wasn't getting done anymore. And you can say, you know, well, it wasn't getting done because there were things in the book that were outdated or stereotypical. Or you can say there are things, it wasn't getting done because uh, Oscar Hammerstein was ill when he did that, the book. He wrote it with Joseph Field. Maybe I think even R&H would have acknowledged it. You know, they called it their lucky hit. Um, but for whatever reason, it wasn't getting done. And it was a shame that these songs and this story based on C.Y. Lee's novel wasn't circulating anymore, wasn't in the, the theater culture. And so that was the main reason I did it. And yeah, I mean, I guess I rewrote a lot of it, but um, it, you know, it, I think, folds in um, elements of the 1960, or uh, whatever, 1958 version as well as elements of the C.Y. Lee novel. Well, I love that he took, I mean, as far as I know, 100 Million Miracles became really, um, showed that the show is about the Chinese American experience because it became basically her journey from China to America, right? It was framed within that. Yeah, we used um, 100 Million Miracles as the kind of opening number and uh, Bobby Longbottom staged a kind of ballet about Mei Li, the main characters, about Mei Li's journey from China to, uh, to America. I have a little clip to show you guys the contrast. Father says that children keep growing, rivers keep flowing too. My father says he doesn't know why, but somehow or other they do. A hundred million miracles. A hundred million miracles. A hundred million miracles. A hundred million miracles. Welcome to America. So, by York, I was when you know it's interesting. David's saying there's no Asian American experience musical. It's true, but I guess you represented though being an Asian American in a chorus line. Your character was born in America, right, Connie Wong? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, Connie Wong. I'm Connie Wong. <laughs> <laughs> born and raised in Chinatown, New York. Yeah. Yeah. But my, uh, you know, the next, the next book I want you to do, do David, is to revise it one step further because my ex-boyfriend who I was with for 10 years was Asian American. I would love this story told through a gay Asian American because try coming out to your Asian American parents when you're the first, where you're the elder son of the elder son and they're Asian American and they're born again Christians. It was amazing for him. So that's your next assignment. Get back to me. Okay, I'll get to work. I mean, I managed to change my name on the uh, screen there. So I think I should be able to, do that too. <laughs> you still got it. So, so Alvin, you know, nowadays we talked a lot about this back in, in June, but we really talked about casting and, and how limited it is casting. There's definitely, there's more awareness now, at least of diverse casting. But back when you were beginning, like what opportunities did you really have? I mean, wh why were you brave enough to go into musical theater when there really weren't any roles for you? There were, there was none. And I couldn't even get into the King and I. They would cast blonde, blue-eyed people for in uh, the role of Lunta. And it used to be so frustrating and aggravating, I can't tell you. And finally, I met a director who happened to be part Asian. And she finally hired me, and that opened doors. And I was then able to get other um, King and I. But for four or five years, I could not get King, the King and I, the only show I could have been in. So I'm very happy now that there cannot be any other thing, anybody else but an Asian in The King and I. So It's about effing time. Yeah. Now, Jose Lana, I was going to say, how are you brave enough to enter a musical theater? But I know how you did it, through a criminal act. So please tell everybody, <laughs> um, I don't know if everyone knows this story. It's one of my favorite stories, but Jose basically broke the law. Please tell everybody what you did. <laughs> 
Well, I was a freshman in college here in New York, and uh, I heard they were auditioning for The King and I on Broadway, and I was not an equity member. And um, but I heard that uh, you could uh, wait and wait and go on an EPA call and and wait all day and be seen at the end of the day. And so I, I skipped class. I was in Manhattan School of Music, and I packed a lunch and I went and waited. Um, and around lunchtime, someone didn't show up for their time slot, and I looked around and I raised my hand. And I just walked in and, and um, I, I sang I sang I Have Dreamed and uh, there was only one person, it was very early in the process, there was only one casting director inside the room, it was just him and the piano player. And he's writing on some guy's resume at the back of it and uh, I sing and, and he's writing on it, he's like, oh, you're gonna get a call back? And I said, and I'm like 18 years old, I'm like crying, I'm like, I thought, I'm like, I'm so sorry, I'm, that's not me, and I just came for the experience, and uh, and and um, I thought they were gonna arrest me or something. I maybe thought I was breaking the law. And he flips over the resume, and it's by this this Robert something, and it said, oh, that's clearly not you. And I gave him my resume, which had nothing on it, and uh, um, and that was March of '95. Uh, and then all summer they kept calling me back about 20 times. So and then and then I booked it. And then I, then I got. It. Them. You know, I love it. It's so brave because it is so bizarre. It's like you can't try out for an equity show unless you're equity, but you can't become equity unless you're in an equity show. Like it's so right. unfair. Yeah. So I love that you just booked the system and you were well, like, you know, I mean, it was also just the, the 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 specific. You know, I read the I read the backstage notice and it was looking for someone who was exactly like me. They were looking for a young baritone, like legit singer and. You know, I mean, it was one of those instances where I, if it was just is for something other than the King and I, I would not have had as much, I think, gumption to do that um, because I was very nervous and I, I didn't know anything. I was I was a freshman in college at a conservatory. I didn't know anything about theater auditioning. I didn't know. I just was just going in there and like trying to sing pretty. And um, but I think it was just the right place, at the right time and the right show. Obviously, it was the, it was it was the good fit. So very did you time. have to, did you have to buy our Glee style choose between going to school or doing the musical? Did you have to quit school? I did, well, you know, I, I had actually, I was already set to transfer. Um, I was transferring to the Royal College of Music in London for my, soft, uh, for, for, for my sophomore year. And I was being called back all summer. And then by the end of the summer, I, I had booked the show. And so I sent a letter to the school and I said, I'd like to defer for a year. And I had all intention of going back. Um, but they were, they sent a very nice letter back. They're like, you know, you booked a Broadway show and a principal part. That's a good reason to, 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 to pause school for a little bit. Um, but then I, I just kept working. So, uh, my, my, my best friend jokes that I'm still a college dropout. So <laughs> beauty school dropout. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Byrick Lee, it's so, you know, these songs just hit standards to me, but what was it like? being at rehearsal and hearing Richard Rogers go, Hey guys, what do you think about this? My father said, like, what was it like hearing that music for the first time? No, we were, we were real close friends from King and I. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he, he would, uh, in King and I, he came around a lot to work with the kids. And so uh, we were all pals. So by the time I got to uh, Flower Drum Song, you know, uh, it was very exciting. In fact, I think I got the show because of Richard Rogers, because when I went to the audition, he remembered me mm -hmm. from King and I, you know, and yeah. Oh, I love so. that. <laughs> so on that Ed Sullivan, there are those two young girls dancing. That's not you. You're not doing the hula hoop step on Ed Sullivan? No, uh, that's uh, Susan Kikuchi is doing the hula hoop, and they're the Re Rebuka twins. They were uh, in in the original. Right, right. You remember and, them? Yes, yeah. uh, of course I remember them. They were in the national company. Yes, yeah. that's so cute. And am I mistaken, or is Larry Blyden playing somebody who's Asian? Yes, he was, yeah. because yeah. he replaced uh, Jack Sue. To, yeah. Jack begged, begged uh, Rogers and Hammerstein to allow him to do the movie. And the right. only way he they, they would allow him that is to ask Larry Blyden to replace him, who was the original. <laughs> so, and, and he was married to Carol Haney. Carol Haney, yes. Yeah. yeah right. Was there any outcry? Like, why is a white person playing an Asian character, or was it just normal? Well, in those days, I... You know, you couldn't fight it. You couldn't fight it at all. So, I mean, it's such a. I've 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 grown so. I mean, Flower Drum Song for me will always be 
um, just like the story, my appreciation for the elders who came before us, who paved the way for uh, for people my generation to actually go yeah. in and demand to be cast in, in parts that were written for people who look like us, and and to have the understanding that people that that your generation didn't have that luxury to go in and say, you know, and so it's uh, even within even in when, within my small like twenty year career when I moved to New York in nineteen ninety four and ninety five. I would even be told flat out to my face, like, no, we're, we're not seeing people like you today, you know? And so, I mean, it's that we, we, we've come a long way and I think Flower Drum Song and, and, and through the eyes of Alvin and obviously by York, we can see like the differences of how actors were treated in terms of ethnicity and the parts that we were allowed to play. Um, and I'm glad that now, even in, in, especially like the King and I and Miss Saigon now, like you, you, you will get in trouble if you try to cast actors who are not of Asian descent. And that's 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 huge, and it's all thanks to the people who who had to live through the kind of crap that that you guys did. I honestly, yeah. it makes me it makes my blood boil when I hear your stories, Alvin and Byark about that. Yeah, I was very very. Go ahead. I was very lucky, Seth, because uh, from the Flower Brum song, you know, and I finished school, and uh, Carol Haney remembered me. Mm -hmm. And I went right into, you know, Bravo Giovanni and mm -hmm. then across the street to Mr. President and then down the street to Here's Love and oh then to God. Golden Boy. And I was so lucky, you know, yeah. uh, to represent. And talented. Just you lucky. And also very, very talented. <laughs> you were a terrific dancer, oh by God. <laughs> I've watched Turkey Lurkey Time maybe a thousand times. Oh, we, we all have. have. Time. No, Bioch, it actually it brings tears to my eyes because it's not you weren't lucky. It was unfair that you have to think you're lucky. You were anyone else anyone else with your talent level would just say I went from show to show because I was good. And it's unfair you have to think you were lucky. It has nothing to it's the world was unfair and you were really talented, but it has nothing to do with luck. They were just assholes and there should have been more people like you. I mean, oh, it just makes me so angry. Um, okay, so look, you guys are all going to come back. We've got to take our medical break because we always have a medical break on this show for COVID. So everybody go take a pee break and we'll be bringing you back in two minutes. Goodbye, Alvin, Mr. Jose, Ms. Bayork, the lovely David. Fix your name one more time when you come back. I want to see what it is. And <laughs> let us have Dr. John LaPook. Chief Medical Correspondent from CBS. And joining me is Mr. James Wesley. You're back. I'm back. And better than ever. I wanted that I, I wanted that smile in my life. I mean, only the only the Seth smile. I'm I didn't feel even. I need both. Well, mine's, smiles. More of, mine's more of a scowl. Um, Dr. LaPook, you were in the middle of the most like climactic conversation last night about vaccinations and then your Wi-Fi went out. So we, we need to hear everything from the top. Go. I will. Did, did you get me when I came back for a tenth of a second and I said, and that's the secret of life? <laughs> Actually, no, but that's very funny. No, dear. <laughs> for, our, for our serious XM listeners, Dr. LaPook, um, can you start from the beginning? Because it really was important, even, but we want to make sure. For the ones who aren't serious. I think it's an important thing to right now put the whole thing in perspective, okay? And I'll try to do this as quickly as I can, but at, first of all, we're entering the Labor Day weekend. Everybody is worried about the kind of behavior that people are gonna do and that we're gonna see uh, a spike in cases. Tony Fauci is very worried about that. I just spoke to him actually today. Um, mm. So everybody's gotta, I know we're, we're sick and tired of the virus, guess what? The virus is not sick and tired of us. We're in the middle of the pandemic right now. Um, it's six months, you know, we're, we're, so this is the time when the fight flight stuff is gone, right? You know, the adrenaline the, and the, uh, the steroid, the cortisol that happens at the beginning, a million years ago in evolution, a saber tooth tiger comes out, exit stage left, that's from adrenaline, steroids, but you can't keep that up for months and months and months. So right now, as that has gone down, we're feeling depressed, we're feeling sad, we're feeling helpless, we're feeling hopeless. You shouldn't feel hopeless. There is gonna be a light around the corner. I really do believe that there is gonna be a vaccine uh, that is gonna work. Uh, but it's gonna probably be not widely available until the, you know, until the beginning of next year. It, it's going to probably be, um, the phase three trials are going on right now, and uh, they're expected to be done sometime in, by November, may, you know, some around November, something like that, maybe December. The controversy you're hearing right now is that there is a letter, there are, there are various signs that there is some political pressure being put on the process 
to get a vaccine out in some form before the election. That's the controversy. So for example, there was a letter that went out for the, from the CDC to governors that said, hey, we need to make sure that you can mobilize distribution of vaccine. And we want, we're setting November 1st as a target date for that. Well, of course you want to be able to mobilize uh, vaccine distribution. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And the fact that everybody's worried about them, that being, oh, they're, they're forcing a November 1st date, just as is a sign of how politicized it's become that we're just questioning everything that's going on. There have been some missteps in terms of political pressure, or there have been indications of political pressure on the CDC, on the FDA. I won't go into that. But uh, now, what, we, what people need to be looking for is that in the, you know, in the next couple of months, there will probably be an application for what's called an emergency use application. I know, folks, this is a little boring, but I want you to know the details here, okay? In June, June 30th, there was a guidance document from the FDA. From the FDA. It said to manufacturers, if you're going to make a vaccine, it's got to be at least it should be at least 50 percent effective. So prevent either 50 percent of the cases or in 50 percent or in at least 50 percent of the cases, either stop the infection or make it significantly better. So 50 percent has been that guideline. Mm -hmm. I interviewed Stephen Hahn, who's the head of the FDA um, at the beginning of the week, and he promised I, I pushed this all to him. I said, is there political pressure? He said, Basically, there's always some political pressure that's going on. But he said, I promise that we will not take shortcuts. We're going to do the usual process. There's going to be what's called an advisory committee that is going to that is made of people who are supposedly, um, you know, who are experts. Um, some of them are uh, in pharma. Some of them are in government, but some and, and others are outside. Um, there are people who are calling for a totally independent review board. Uh, but that's going to be impractical. And the FDA shot that down when I asked Dr. Hahn about that. So that's going to happen. He's committed to it being public. And when I said, okay. is every piece of data going to be available to the public? He said, as much as as legally allowed, because there's some stuff that's proprietary that they can't release, I guess, from the companies. OK, so I then went back at the FDA. And here's the punchline, everybody. I said, is it possible that an EUA, an emergency use authorization, not a full approval, will be, could it be granted without 50% effect effectiveness of the vaccine? And the answer was yes. They said yes, if it could be a subset, like a, a subset of the population, a particularly high risk group, where they're looking at the totality of all the evidence and they decide that the benefits outweigh the risk. That's different than saying it's gotta be 50%. So there are some alarms going off for some people. We just have to make sure this goes through the normal process because if it doesn't, then there's going to be questions by the public about whether or not they should be taking this. And there's already vaccine hesitancy, as we know. So if you need 70% of, of the population immune in order to get this herd immunity, 70% either is vaccinated and immune or, or got the disease and is immune, 30% of the population is already saying they're not taking it. That means that the other 70%, everybody has to take it, has to be 100% effective. That's right. unlikely. If in addition to that, people are now questioning the very process, you know, CDC, FDA has been church. It's been things that we just believed in. If that's starting to come into question, um, there's a real problem in terms of, of confidence. So stand by. Um, Major figures, including Tony Fauci, including Francis Collins, who's the head of the NIH, have stepped forward. They are making their voices heard. Uh, and I think we just all have to keep our standards high and embrace the science and not not be pressured by the by the politics of it. And if we do see that pol political pressure coming, we have to speak up. Right. We have to really speak up and, and demand that we have all the data and that Everybody is seeing it, and if everybody agrees that we, it's okay, then fine. That's one thing. But don't just say, yeah, we looked at it. We can't quite tell you all the, the data, and that went into the analysis, but we're approving it. That would be something that I think there'd be a lot of pushback on. So that was a long thing. I'm telling you that took me probably 200 hours to understand in terms of research I did over the past 10 days. And I gave it to you in a quick eight minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. LaPook. We're, we're going to hope for the best.
That's right. Hope huh. for the best, but uh, what is it? Trust and verify. And Danielle says, when it's all over, I just want to give Dr. LaPook a huge hug for all oh. he's done for us. <laughs> well, I appreciate all the support and the ability to have this time to explain it. And uh, I owe one last plug for this guy named Seth Rudetsky. Last night, I turned on a, a podcast with um, Marty Short and you. Oh, my newest. Oh, my gosh, is that good. And I'll tell you what's good about it. You were so specific. I once read a book on how to interview your parents, and they said, instead of uh, saying, like, what was it like as a kid, you say, okay, when you were walking to school, what, what stores did you pass? And did you ever go in? You went into a, a, a grocery store? Did they, they give you a piece of bologna? So those were the kind of things you were doing. You were saying in high school, remember, were you the class clown? Were you bullied? How did you, you – you went into such specifics, and that led him – I never heard him talk like that before. I never heard oh, nice. a good interview of him. So, brava, as you would say. Seriously. Brava. Go out and watch that and, and listen to that. It's fantastic. Thank you, guys. I love Marty Short, so, you know, what's you not too, I'm obsessed with Comedy Idol. Thank you to the program. Right, what a great have ending. A, have a great weekend. Uh, we'll see you, you on too. Tuesday. Our 200th episode is next week. Is that you know? the 200th episode is next week? Not, 200 Tuesday. Uh, Thursday is our 200th. 200 Thursday. Okay, still have the alliteration, yeah. but it's the two T's, but not quite the same. Yeah, the right word. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Talk He's to you. Uh, bye, Dr. Pook. Right, bye, Dr. Bye. How nice. <laughs> P.S. Nice. That podcast, it's called Seth Rudetsky's Back to School, and it's on Sirius X and Pandora, or wherever wherever you get your local podcast. all about high school. I love that he listens to that. I know, all right, James, right. go back to work. Yes. Hold on, though. You're Wait, literally why? about to run out of power. Oh, my God. Okay, all hold right. on. Is it charging? Yeah. I think it's working. okay. We're gonna bring back our okay. flower dome song, Peeps. Please welcome from the revival cast, Mr. Jose Liana. Please Hello. welcome Ms. Bayark Lee. She is Connie Wong. Please welcome from every production ever, Alvin Ng. And sporting his brand new name, <laughs> please welcome <laughs> DJ Master DHH. <laughs> you still got it. <laughs> I can't. Um, hey, by the way, we're getting donations. Byrock, I want to say, Brant Blocker wrote, um, this is Love Your City Springs Theater Family. They donated to the Actors Fund $250 in honor of Byrock Lee. Oh, great. Thank you so much. And I'm going to be uh, directing West Side Story down there in Atlanta next year. Um, have you ever seen my Anita? Because I still got it. <laughs> Non-traditional casting, non-traditional. Um, okay, so David, so talk to me about changing the script. I mean, how do you, obviously there are going to be sort of traditional, aka stereotypical stories in a sense about this, the Asian American experience. How do you sort of, you know, how do you make it an interesting story, take out the stereotypes, but also keeping things that are stereotypes because they're also sort of realistic? How do you balance that? I mean, I guess the way I looked at it was that, you know, if you think about the lyric from Grant Avenue, it's um, you travel there, Chinatown, you travel there in a trolley, in a trolley up you climb, mm -hmm. go. And any one of those. But the, <laughs> the, it's, been, it's been a while. Um, but the point is that, okay, that suggests who's the you there? The you is kind of a oh. tourist eye point of view. You are taking the trolley to get there as opposed to you actually live there and this is your world. And I think that was the, just trying to shift the lens was one way to discuss the overall principle. Um, and then, you know, I just, I stuck with most of the plot points, but for instance, uh, the idea that May Lee was a, um, a picture bride who was brought in in the 50s didn't really make sense because it just like historically that wouldn't have been the case, right? China became communist in 1949. So the idea that you could somehow order right. a picture bride from communist China who to come to the US when there were no relationship between the two countries just didn't make sense. So it's a, you know, you just sort of go down each one. And, um, and then I think, you know, one of the, big things that we did was we took the um, the nightclub, uh, which, which is in the original musical version, but not in the novel. So the nightclub 
was a um, Hammerstein and Fields invention. And we took that and we sort of made that central to the whole story. And so if this was going to be sort of about assimilation and Americanization and the pluses and minuses of it, it would be a nightclub, a, a traditional Chinese theater that becomes a Western style nightclub, similar to the chop suey circuit that existed in Chinatowns and America throughout the 50s. And those were the basic principles on which we built the show. I love that it's called the chop suey circuit. It's like the borscht belt and the yeah. chitlin circuit. That's so interesting. I never knew it was called that. Oh, wow. Um, you know, speaking of the nightclub, in the revival version, I Enjoy Being a Girl is a nightclub song, isn't it? Yes. In the original, Pat Suzuki. Now, that's, by the way, again, like with the Bayark Lee, it's like Pat Suzuki should have basically starred in every single musical from Flower Dome Song on. Like, she could have been Fanny Bryce. Like, that voice was so incredible. Bayark, what was it like to be, that was like before body mics. Did your, did your wig flow off from Pat Suzuki's voice? I, I, everybody had a ponytail, everybody had bangs, and everybody wanted to sing like Pat Suzuki. Yeah. Um, I mean, she was just the it. And we bought all of her vinyl albums. You know, she was a jazz singer, I believe, in San Francisco. They, that's where they found her. And uh, we all wanted to be Pat Suzuki. I wanted to be Pat Suzuki. I wanted to be Pat Suzuki. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I'm going to play you her. Listen to this placement. I'm, I'm strictly a female. Female, and my future home will be in the arms of a brave and female who. Here, her placement on who. It's like, is it a belt? Is it a mix? No one knows. It's brilliant. Listen to this. And what I also love, by the way, is. I enjoy being a girl, but it's so aggressive. So it's so not a feminine. It's like she's so aggressive. I love the contrast. Oh, I'm, I'm obsessed. I shrink the female, female, and my future I hope to be in the home of a brave female who Wow, what a voice, what a voice. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I mean, like the, oh my God, I can't, I can't get over it. Oh man. Okay, so Jose Lana, you're talking about, you got to, you got to perform with Leia Salonga. How long did it take you to stop calling her Ms. Salonga? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just say my, my final callback, and I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if David remembers this, but like I, I was in that room and I, I was auditioning against, I believe, Leia's ex-boyfriend at the time. Um, oh. oh, yeah. Mike, yeah, Mike Lee, right? And so I'm thinking- Oh, great, we're oh. just gonna say his name. Oh, was it Mike? Oh, Mike Lee? Oh my God. <laughs> well, like, I, I also was like, uh, I'm not gonna get this. Like this, I, I, was so, I was so nervous coming up and then I see him in the hallway, I'm like, Shh, never mind. You know, and I, I was so, and so I went in there and I sang the song and I don't know what I what made me think to do it, but I, I at the end of my song and, and Leia was there, I grabbed her at the end of the song and I just planted a big kiss on her. Oh. Um, and, and I don't think I would have done that if I if I was if I, if I really thought about it like that was slightly inappropriate, but um, uh, you know I think that kind of broke the ice definitely. And then when I and then when I finally booked it and we were in LA for the for the for the for the taper production. Um, you know, Leia just, we just sort of, we met and, you know, I told her that I, I had her album with that when she was 10 years old like this and, that, um, you know, and, and we, but we, from day one, we were, we were, we were working professionals together and it was, but still, I would still get emails and phone calls from all my family members and they're like, you're doing a show with Leia, you're doing a show with Leia, you know, and, and still to this day, it's, it's, it's every Filipino, especially the Filipinos who live in the Philippines, it's, um, it's, it's huge. You know, she's last long. I mean, come on. Can, can I can I just say that as a general principle, the notion that of being the ex boyfriend of the leading lady is not necessarily a plus in terms of getting cast. <laughs> <laughs> David, you're hilarious. <laughs> and Bobby, Jose, people may not know you're literally you were born in the Philippines. I was, yeah, and I moved here when I was very young. I was three. And uh, my mother, because my mother's job, she had she worked at the IMF, International Monetary Fund in DC. Um, I retained my Filipino citizenship until I was uh, I I got naturalized when I was twenty. So I retained I was a Filipino citizen with a Filipino passport all, all my entire childhood. Um, 
Oh, yeah. Man. So and so, I mean, to to link to to Wang Ta and, and the character I played, you know, when Bobby and I and David and I would would talk about, um, you know, it was so it became very very personal to me and about a guy who was struggling between, you know, uh, honoring his parents but doing something that he loved and and being a performer and. It, 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 there were so many times in the rehearsal process where I started, I had, I was having a hard time um, separating Jose and, and Wang Ta, um, especially as David was writing these scenes, you know, and um, it was a very powerful experience for me. And, and opening night of both the taper and on Broadway uh, to have my dad in the audience and to have my parents in the audience was, was very overwhelming uh, because I was basically playing a version of myself on stage. So. I'm going to show how confident you are with Leia. And by the way, your lace front is stunning. Your hair is so long. I can't even see the lace. Here, let's take a look. and Jose Lana from Flower Drum Song. Thank you for joining us this morning. Oh my God. Oh. Ah. Nice. Very nice. <laughs> that was so nervous. That was so nervous. Yeah, you look like you look those old clips of like, you know, I, I honestly, I think I, I, I probably sweat through like three undershirts when you go on. And I was so unbelievably nervous for that. And it was so early in the morning too. I, and I was like, I wasn't sure. I was the, the voice, the notes were going to come out. And I was. Oh my God. God, God, you sound good. So hard. You have sounded wonderful. Yeah. You know, Alvin, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about Asian parents. And I was saying before that my, my ex-boyfriend, he really wanted to be a piano player and his parents basically kind of prevented it. And this is, you know, in the eighties, what was it like for you telling your parents you wanted to be a performer? Did you ever tell them or did you keep it a secret? No, it all, well, it happened as if it were an accident, but as we know, there are no accidents. I came to New York to go to school at Columbia, and I'm, I was going to be a, a teacher. So I made, I got my master's in music ed. And then one day I happened to see um, a, a composer from Honolulu that I had worked with as an amateur. And he said, uh, walk with me to my agent's office. And I did. And he, the agent asked me, what are you gonna do? I said, I'm gonna go to Columbia in the fall. He says, uh, and what did you major in? I said, music. I said, do you sing? I said, yes, I sang. So he asked me to sing. I sang for him. One month or two months later, I happened to see him on the street. And he asked me out of the clear blue, would you be interested in auditioning as a replacement for summer stock? And I said, what's summer stock? <laughs> he explained it to me. I said, let me think about it tonight and I'll let you know in the morning. That night I couldn't sleep. I knew that my life was going to change. Somehow I did know. I called him in the morning. He told me what to do. I, I took the train to Camden, New Jersey. Um, Delisola was the conductor for South Pacific there. And I sang for him. He accepted me. I took the train back, packed my bags and I was in show business. So are there accidents? Are there no accidents? Who knows? But that was, I had no idea I was ever going to be in show business. Ever. Yes, but, but Alvin, what was the conversation? Dear daddy, I'm dropping out of an Ivy League school to do summer stock. Did you ever tell him or are you still pretending that you're getting your degree? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, everything was very open. I told my mom, you know, I, I'm going to do the show. And I just dropped out of Columbia. That's all. But eventually I did go back and I got my master's in music ed. Yeah. Okay. I, I knew there was a wrap around. Now, by the way, people that are wondering, Alvin, your voice is so beautiful. Usually when people sing songs from shows they did in the past, they drop at seven and a half steps. You have the nerve to still, you're still singing the original key. Listen how beautiful the voice is. Here you go, people.
Thank you. Thank you. Like, well, I'm very fortunate. I still have some voice left. I can't hit the high notes like I used to, but I, I can still sing. Thank uh, you. Yes, you can, ma'am. Okay, speaking of singing, we have a little surprise. Oh, yes, Bayard, did you want to say something? Yes, I wanted to say that my, my company, National Asian Artist Project, gave Alvin his Life Achievement uh, Award. Oh, thank you. That's thank you. you very much. Yeah. I appreciate that, yeah. Of course. Well, you deserve it. And Bayark, I love that you do that. All right. So listen, we have a surprise from the Philippines. So let us all enjoy Ms. Lea Salanga. She still got it. Of course. I have wished before. I will wish no more. Love, look away. Love, look away from me Fly when you pass my door Fly and get lost at sea Call it a day Love, let us say we're through No good are you for me No good am I for And no, nah. no modification of the vowel from May. It was pure me. <laughs> so beautiful. Hey, Jose yeah. Luna, people are donating to the Actors Fund. I texted you some donations to read. Check your phone, please. Oh, you did. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. All right. So we have uh, $50 from Trinda. <clears throat> All right. And Susan from California did $25. And... Uh, Donation, oh, $50 for the Revival Tour cast who performed with me at my show in Seattle. Love your favorite Seattle drag queen, Mark, Mom, Finley. Hi, Mark. <laughs> uh, $100 from Carmine. And uh, thank you, Carmine. And Caroline from New York, $50, sending lots of love to Bay York from Long Island. Uh, How sweet. Thank you, everybody, for helping the Actors Fund. And David, what do you, now is the time we're in isolation. How many plays have you written in the last five months? You've had all this time. Go. <laughs> um, short plays. And uh, we'll have to see what I've, what I've still, what I've got after uh, we start to produce again. Yeah. Not really an answer. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's all good. Okay. Jose Lana, you promised me you're going to sing live for everybody to close out our show. What do you okay. got to leave? All right. Uh, well, I'm going to sing. Actually, I was going to sing Sunday, but uh, I think after Leah just sang that song, I th think it's better for me to sing the song that closes, that closed our show, um, A Little Like a God. So yes. here we go.
Am I the man that you love? If that is true, I am more Something beyond and above The man that I was before Like a god with my head above the trees I can walk with a god-like stride With a step I can clear the seven seas When I know you are by my side like a god with a mountain in my hand and my arm thrown around the sky. All the world will be mine at my command when you're near and I hear you sigh. When you're near and I hear you sigh. There is no sweeter song I know. With a heart full of hope I fly. Higher I go, stronger I grow. Like a god, I can tear away the mist from the sky if you want it blue. In the wake of the mist, like a goddess, you'll be kissed by a god in love with you. Um, let's <laughs> Yes, one more time. One, one more time. <laughs> oh my God, the high placement is amazing. Um, okay, you still got it. Liz still got it. Alvin still got it. And Bayark, you said you're going to end with the Cassie dance. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Ten cents the dance. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, guys, this was so much fun. I want to remind everybody the Flower Dome song, the double album is out. It's a Barnes and Noble. We have the original, we have the revival. It's such a beautiful, beautiful score. David promises me he's writing a play to be starring me, and I really appreciate that, David. Thank you so much. I'm just going to take that at face value. Um, can I thank uh, Dana Siegel and the people at Concord for organizing all of this? Oh, Dana, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you. So speaking of Concord, you know, you can license Flower Dome Song. Nothing's stopping you, people. So it's a great show. So time to start licensing it for when the damn quarantine is over. Thank you, Byrick, for making your second appearance. Jose, like your 58th appearance. <laughs> Alvin, I want you back. I love your voice. David, we'll do it. We'll do an M Butterfly with, with BD. That'll be really fun. We'll do a reunion. Oh my God. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Let's totally do that. And Alec Mappa for Sass. Um, anyway. <laughs> I'm, gonna run, run. Uh, I'm gonna run. Wait, do I have any final things that I want to show? Okay. I'm gonna show um the final little credits here. Hold on. Everybody just watch this for two seconds. I usually I play in the piano some music, but I'm in the Provincetown Hotel room. So all I can do is sing, my father said. <laughs> oh, anybody? <laughs> Nobody. That's that's the revival, the all gay version. Um, <laughs> Jose Lana, we have to have you back. Oh, you're going to come back with 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee Reunion. Yes, let me know when that is. I'm not sure exactly yes, when that is. Actually, you know what? I picked a date and I forgot to tell you. I wrote to Jesse Ferguson. Yeah. Great. What the hell is the date? Hold on. While I have you, while while these credits are rolling, I'm going to tell you what the date is. September 25th, as in 25th okay. annual. September 25th. All right. Thank you, everybody. We love Flower Dome Song. Bye. Bye. Thank you for watching. Bye, and guys. Bye.